If people have questions later on, uh, that's fine too. Uh, we'll just uh, run right into it. Uh, I'm going to cover uh, several things today, uh, specifically about key management standards. Um, if you've been active in the cryptography community, uh, if you deploy cryptographic devices, um, if your enterprise is in the, uh, the financial sector, uh, pretty much uh, anybody that has uh, used or will deploy cryptographic devices in the next couple of years is going to be concerned about uh, key management standards. Uh, we're going to go over uh, the problems as to why there are so many different key management products or, or why so many uh, cryptographic uh, systems have their own key management products. Uh, the uh, problems around interoperability. Uh, the contenders, as I like to say them, these are the four different standards that uh, we'll be covering today. Uh, we're going to go through each one, a uh, basic message set of each one. Uh, one of them does not actually specify a message, but we'll go into some details on that. And uh, we'll see where each of these plays out, so to speak, in the industry, where the overlaps are, um, you know, who the, uh, who the players are, that sort of thing. And then uh, finally, we'll, we'll go through the actual details of each of the, uh, of the standards. Uh, before we uh, jump into it, uh, anybody from any of the four committees that I'm going to talk about? Uh, OASIS, KMIP, EKMI, IEEE 1619.3, which one? Which one? The uh, key prov. Uh, the key prov? OK, good. And uh, anybody else from key prov? OK. So in the last uh, several months, I've talked to um, uh, members of these communities, uh, different uh, chair, chair members, uh, all these different committees, uh, to get their kind of take on the uh, industry as a whole, uh, their, their place in the world, where they overlap with other standards, uh, that sort of thing. I, I spoke at uh, NIST, which is the American uh, standards body, um, a government standards body, about a month and a half ago. And uh, Phil uh, Hoyer from the KeyProv uh, committee was there, and we talked quite a bit about this stuff. Uh, and as uh, uh, somebody said earlier, if you don't have lolcats, um, then you know your your uh, presentation just isn't isn't there. So I had to run and uh, grab this real fast. Um, I'm in your house stealing your keys. So uh, that's just uh, hopefully uh, break the ice a little bit here. Oh, more keys. Um, we're we're going to talk about uh, the, the first piece here, um, all the different uh, uses of keys, key management, cryptographic devices, all that sort of fun stuff. I, I took this picture yesterday at the uh, Imperial Treasury. Um, so if you guys are tourists or if you're local Viennese, you can go down to the uh, Imperial Treasury and see these keys. That's actually quite, quite an interesting um, uh, facility and, and uh, a museum. Uh, although, if you're a native Viennese, I, I will tell you that just standing there, I saw at least two or three different ways to break into the case and not get caught. So um, maybe the keys aren't that important as the crown and that sort of thing. So, so this is a snapshot of the problem, right? Uh, anybody that has deployed or used or um, has thought about uh, cryptographic systems in their enterprises uh, has this problem. H how, many have, uh, how many have to deal with PCI? Financials, credit card companies, so maybe, sort of. How about EU privacy? Yeah, everybody, right? Yeah. EU privacy. Uh, uh, I don't know if there's an equivalent to... Um, uh, HIPAA here in, in uh, the EU, but uh, HIPAA is a healthcare privacy um, initiative in the U.S. Yeah, big, yeah, big time, right? Um, so a lot of the different, and uh, if anybody's interested in different uh, standards or uh, laws or legislation about uh, cryptography, um, you can come see me later. That's not really where I want to go, but uh, suffice to say that in your enterprises, uh, cryptographic products are deployed, period. Um, there's nobody in this room that should raise their hand and say, I don't use cryptography in my environment at all. Either you're using SSL, symmetric keys to protect uh, data at rest, um, asymmetric keys to do signing, uh, certificates, whatever the case may be. Uh, and some enterprises use this uh, quite extensively. 
I'll give an example. Uh, financial services industry um, uh, in the U.S., there's a, a body that, uh, that's called the FFIEC. Don't ask me the acronym. I can never remember. Um, but basically, they say, um, thou shalt encrypt all your uh, data that goes to tape, all your archive data. That's pretty common practice. Um, it's uh, very widespread. But uh, the reality is that uh, in financial systems, you have uh, mainframes, you have mid-range systems, and you have distributed systems. Well, for each of those three major platforms, you might have a different uh, tape system to encrypt your data, um, or just to write tapes in general. So each one of these different systems to write tape might also engender some different system to encrypt that data. So as you can see here, um, you know, you have this plethora of devices in your environment, and uh, each one has their own key management system. It's great, right? All these symmetric key products that are out there. That you you could buy uh, something from uh, from EMC, RSA, or from IBM. I, I should ask first. Anybody from IBM? Okay, good. Anybody from EMC or RSA? Oh, even better. And uh, any anybody that uh, is from Sun, Oracle. Oh, great. This is gonna. This is really good. So. This will be good because I can I can dish on all the, the fun political stuff uh, that goes on and these vendor love fests that happen uh, during these standards meetings. Uh, just full disclosure, um, I participate in the standards community as an individual, uh, not as a vendor representative. So I get to you know like be the objective observer, right? So anyways, um, all these key different key management systems all have their own symmetric key management uh, systems to, to go along with them, right? Some of them have overlap. Some of them say, well, if you, uh, if you have uh, brand X, then you can manage the keys from brand X on brand Y. Um, IBM used to tell me this all the time. They say, no problem. You've got all these, all these systems. Um, that's great. Uh, why don't you get all your keys and uh, we'll put them on the mainframe? All right. Well, that's that's great. But uh, uh, how do I get them to the mainframe? Oh, just you know, export them out of whatever symmetric key system you've got, and just drop them into the mainframe. It will store them just perfectly. Well, that's not really key management, right? That's key storage. Or they might do key generation, or any of the, any of the vendors that are out there um, would say, well, I'll do you know these three pieces of the key management lifecycle, but not the other uh, ten pieces or, or whatever. The the uh, the, the the final result is that all these different systems have um, proprietary protocols. They're very disparate. They're not interoperable. Uh, the, um, all the different devices out there speak their own language, uh, their own authentication systems. Uh, they're just completely different. And this is a big problem, uh, because if you're anything like my environment was uh, a few years back, I had every single brand of HSM every single brand of storage, every single brand of network device, and they all uh, use their own uh, proprietary systems to manage keys. And that was a real pain in the ass. Um, th this is just a kind of a graphical demonstration of what we've been talking about. Um, you can see up at the top there. I hope everybody can read that. Uh, it doesn't matter what the, what's in the boxes, but uh, um, you can see that um, for each different type of system you have, you might also have a different type of application. Uh, everybody's familiar with web servers and SSL certificates, right? Okay, well, these systems, you might have certificate systems that are spread across client, server, network environments. But, um, you know, for example, over on the storage space, the storage side is uh, largely dominated by symmetric key systems because symmetric keys are faster. You can encrypt, you know, bulk data very quickly rather than using asymmetric uh, systems. Uh, you know, let's say on, uh, on server side, you have SSH systems and you're using asymmetric keys, but you might also use certificates uh, on your uh, SSH management. And PGP is some other type of key system entirely. And on the mainframe, you could have all these different types of systems. And you know, everywhere else, you've got a mix of lots of different types of cryptographic objects that are managed completely different ways. Uh, you don't treat an asymmetric key pair the same way as you treat a symmetric key. Uh, you don't treat a, a certificate the same way that you treat an asymmetric key pair or PGP key ring or 
or uh, nonces or passwords or salt or whatever the case may be. So um, this is a, a pretty broad problem to overcome. As a customer in this space, um, myself and a lot of other people started to push on the, on the vendors, IBM, RSA, uh, the storage vendors, and said, look, I, I like your products, but um, I'm not going to buy another one until uh, I can actually use one system to manage the keys across multiple, multiple environments. And, and the reason this is so important is that um, encryption is a business critical service. Right? You're not encrypting stuff you don't care about. You only encrypt the stuff that's the most valuable. Uh, the, uh, the, the reality is that um, when you encrypt something, you complicate your business processes. Um, what's the, uh, uh, besides encrypting a piece of data, what's the, what's the other most important thing that you can do? Decrypt the data, right? Uh, so it's equally important to be able to encrypt data as it is to decrypt data. Probably even more important to be able to decrypt data, right? Uh, because you need to know who, who should be allowed to decrypt this data, who's allowed to use it, um, you know, all these different types of use cases. But it, it, it totally impacts your business process, right? Um, you think about uh, the, the key archive uh, situation. You write uh, data to tape, you archive it, you, you, you encrypt this data on the tape. And then you ship it to Iron Mountain or whatever the, the European equivalent is of, a, of the off-site storage, right? If, if you don't know who can uh, decrypt that data, when it gets back so you can restore it, you're going to have a tape that, with useless data. Without the keys to do the work, it's just ones and zeros that don't mean anything to you. The, uh, the other thing I want to I uh, mention here is um, a value transfer from data to keys. And this is something that, that uh, uh, not even a lot of uh, enterprise practitioners in security understand. When you encrypt a piece of data, um, you transfer the business value from the, uh, from the data to the keys that were used to encrypt that data. So for all intents and purposes, the, the key is your data at that point. So it doesn't make any sense to, uh, and it's, you know, in some cases, I'll go back for a second, some cases when you encrypt data, you're super concentrating uh, the value of that, that data into one key or a set of keys. So it doesn't do you any good to um, treat keys as public data, and everybody should know that. Um, symmetric keys have to be secret, private keys, private, right? No, it's, yes. Uh, so the, the protections that you apply to, uh, to, the val to the data in the clear, you should also apply protections to the, to the keys themselves, right? Um, this is without the key, data is useless. So this is a, this is a very important uh, concept. And it's important for your business partners in your, uh, in your organization to understand this as well. So I, I did say this is a death match. <laughs> um, and uh, it, this isn't so much as a death match as it is a, uh, you know, the uh, rock and sock in here. But um, I want you to, uh, I want you to all think about this from the uh, from the outside. Uh, I've had a lot of questions because people I know have um, know that I'm on the standards, different committees, and things like that. And they they come to me and they say, well, these standards aren't they going to are they going to make everything great or? Um, the, why are there so many standards? Why, why isn't there just one key management standard? So let's go through the, uh, the different pieces. The first one I want to talk about is, is called KMIP. Uh, this is an OASIS committee. Uh, it stands for Key Management Interoperability Protocol. I'm a member of this committee. I'm a member of this one and, and one of the other OASIS committees that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, KMIP uh, started very recently. It actually was uh, started this year. Uh, the very first meeting was at RSA uh, US uh, this year. And uh, since nobody is from uh, EMC or RSA, I can kind of um, dish on uh, some of this. The way that KMIP uh, came about is that uh, the IEEE 1619.3 committee, which is that one there, uh, was very focused on storage. A lot of the uh, members of uh, the IEEE committee weren't necessarily satisfied with the way that the, uh, that committee was going. And they decided to found this KMIP uh, committee. And you can't tell anybody this stuff, because if you do, I'll deny it. And then you know, it just didn't happen. Uh, but but uh, the KMIP uh, protocol is a way for 
uh, different devices, different actors in the key management lifecycle to communicate with each other, which is something that the IEEE standard had yet to define. And they were kind of in a gridlock, and you know there was typical standard stuff: people not liking each other, and you know ven one vendor didn't like some other vendor's approach, that sort of stuff. So um, KMIP was formed uh, with the uh, express uh, goal of creating a protocol for different devices to be able to commute, communicate, and pass keys, generate keys, st store keys, all these sorts of things. It's kind of a logical thing to do, right? You know, you've got a box that has some keys, and you've got another box somewhere else that has some keys. You want to be able to move keys around, or generate keys, or request keys, or do different things like that. So, so KMIP uh, was formed, and um, I'll read this section of the charter here because I, I think it's important to understand um, the the charter that uh, that each one of these um, has been started with. So. Uh, KMIP will uh, develop specifications for the interoperability of uh, key management, KM I, I shortened to, or key management I short, short, shortened to KM. Uh, KM services with KM clients uh, will address anticipated customer requirements for key lifecycle management, generation, refresh, distribution, tracking, lifecycle, uh, states, uh, archive, and destruction key sharing, long-term availability of crypto objects of all types. So, so if you're looking at this and you're going, wow, that's a lot of stuff, man. That's, you know, that's a lot of, uh, lot of information that could happen there. That's a, that's a pretty broad protocol. So in scope for this is just about everything. Um, the founders of the committee and the committee itself, and uh, again, I'm one of the members of this committee, believe that um, uh, a protocol that um, defines the interoperability between devices through uh, use cases and um, uh, different uh, uh, profiles for different systems um, should be pretty inclusive. The, uh, the, thing that, the things that are out of scope are um, uh, the implementation of the, uh, of the system. So, so what I mean by that is um, KMIP isn't going to publish code. Uh, I think there's some sample code. There might be some sample implementation stuff, but um, the uh, committee itself is not going to publish code. Nor is it going to publish a box, right? Um, you build a box or anything like that. This is an open standard. Uh, so the, uh, the, the actual um, implementation details of how you would implement this protocol are uh, up in the air. Uh, so from a, <laughs> just kind of an aside, from a security perspective, uh, this could be good or bad, right? Um, if there are uh, uh, mistakes or uh, choices that, um, that the protocol um, uh, makes, either explicitly or Im implicitly, then you can um, either enhance or uh, detract from those different uh, mistakes or decisions in an implementation. Um, so that's, uh, that's a, an important thing to, to think about is um, uh, this standard will be published. The members of this committee include people like IBM, TALIS, uh, RSA, EMC, uh, Cisco, uh, SafeNet, who else I got up there, um, LSI, uh, a couple others. So all the, you know, all the major vendors that are out there in the security space, all the major vendors that are in the storage space, because a lot of them came over from this IEEE committee. So all of these, these vendors are going to uh, develop systems that will um, conform to this standard. So tape systems, tape libraries, uh, HSMs, um, uh, crypto uh, libraries for clients, all that sort of stuff. So I probably should have put this one first, but um, sorry about that. Uh, IEEE 1619.3. So uh, IEEE committees are uh, numeric. Um, each one has a specific meaning and all that sort of stuff. I'm not going to go into that. 1619.3 is a subcommittee from the 1619 uh, working group. The 1619 working group is the, uh, where, where did I put it, secure, uh, Security and Storage Working Group. And members of this committee are uh, same, same types of folks, right? Sun, uh, Vormetric, Cisco, EMC, RSA, LSI, uh, IBM, 
So similar types of uh, systems, similar types of folks. Now, the, uh, the goal of this committee is, is very different than KMIP. And I'll read this here. Standard, the standard defines methods for the storage, management, distribution of cryptographic keys used for the protection of stored data. So you didn't see that sort of language in the KMIP uh, charter. And it's right here, um, you know, defining the scope of this, this uh, standard. Uh, the standard augments existing key, uh, key management methodologies to address issues specific to cryptographic protection of stored data. Again, there it is, stored data. This includes stored data protected by compliant implementations of other standards in IEEE 6019.3 family. So I apologize if I, if I uh, speak too quickly here, but um, 1619 family has a dot one, dot two, and dot three uh, subgroups. Uh, dot three is this one, um, but uh, there are other, the other two groups also have um, uh, some impact in the cryptographic space, although no, they're not, they're not uh, focused on the standards. So in scope here, um, as it says right here in the, uh, the charter, uh, and you can look this stuff up, this stuff's public. Um, if you go do a search for this committee, you can go find lots of information. Protection of stored data. And the way they, uh, they define that is um, uh, kind of uh, nebulous, but um, you know, the first application was tapes. Uh, the second application was disk. So, uh, you know, obviously you store data on disk, you store data on tape. Uh, interfaces, methods, and algorithms is uh, the, the, the pieces of, um, of the standard that they, uh, that they define. So, um, allowed algorithms include uh, NIST approved um, it, modes of AES. So. Um, that's an example there. Um, an approved method might be um, HMACing or something like that. Uh, out of scope here is uh, a transport encryption and non-storage use cases. So um, they don't care much about SSL. Um, they don't care much about application integration. Um, not too much, um, you know, uh, interest in um, asymmetric key signing. You know, anything like that. Uh, the best way that I can describe the standard is that it's a, a set of use cases that have been standardized um, so that um, one tape library or one storage library, some physical system, uh, can interoperate with some other vendor's system. And when the crypto application or the, uh, um, the uh, data that's encrypted on one system can be successfully decrypted on another system through the exchange of, excuse me, after lunch thing, you know. Uh, through the exchange of the keys and uh, different uh, information required to decrypt the data. If anybody, anybody's got questions, please just raise the hand. I, I don't uh, mind at all. Uh, so the third one we're going to talk about here is um, uh, EKMI. Uh, and this is another OASIS. Everybody familiar with OASIS? It's an open standards group. Um, this one is... Um, EKMI, which stands for Enterprise Key Management Infrastructure. Uh, so this is, um, uh, this started about 2007. I think I joined this committee in, in uh, mid-2007. And uh, it was started by a guy named uh, Arshad Noor. I don't know, some, some of you might know Arshad. He's the uh, CTO over at uh, StrongKey. Um, and what they basically did was uh, they took their existing uh, protocol that they used in their products and made it open source. It's a little, it's evolved uh, quite a bit beyond that t today, but um, that's basically where this started. Um, the what's interesting about this committee from a participation uh, perspective is that there's not a lot of vendor participation, um, and the vendors that are involved are, are definitely not the the heavy hitters in the uh, security and uh, key management cryptographic space. Um, you've got Red Hat. Uh, the current chair uh, of, of um, the committee is from Red Hat, uh, CA, um, Wells Fargo, which is, a, which is a bank in the United States, PayPal, I think everybody knows who PayPal is, right? Uh, Prime Key, uh, a, a company that's out of uh, Europe here. Um, again, not, a, not a, a heavy player in the uh, security or cryptographic space. Um, but what is interesting uh, from a participation perspective is that um, uh, these are uh, all folks that are very interested in application integration of, of crypto cryptography rather than uh, box level uh, applications. So no representation, 
I won't say no, but um, there's very limited representation from HSM vendors. Everybody know what an HSM is? Hardware security module. It's a, a device you plug into your network or plug into a, a box, or it's a card you plug into a system. That's where you store keys and do secure operations. <coughs> So the, uh, I'll go through uh, some of the bullet points on the charter, um, and you'll see some um, overlap uh, very quickly here with some of the other stuff here. So the technical committee will create use cases to describe how and where protocols tends to create will be used. These are the, the uh, 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 different use cases. Uh, define symmetric key management protocols. Uh, ensure cross-implementation interoperability. Uh, create a test suite. Uh, allow different implementations of this protocol to be certified. Uh, provide guidance on how symmetric key management infrastructure may be secured using asymmetric keys. Um, other, other standards, organizations focus on disciplines outside of OASIS um, will provide input on how uh, enterprise key management infrastructures may be managed. Um, other activities educate users. So, again, what's in scope here is um, basically all symmetric keys. Um, uh, and beyond that, all symmetric uh, secrets, um, including salts or hashes, you know, salt hash, that sort of thing, uh, secured using defined infrastructure. Now, um, beyond the, uh, uh, the message that is defined in EKMI, they also define an, um, uh, an architecture, so to speak. So um, our Shad's vision, uh, the, the, the first chair of the uh, committee, was to define not only a, a language or a protocol, an agreement upon how to exchange symmetric keys, but also a way to uh, do this securely. Um, so the way that, uh, that they decided to do this was to implement an asymmetric system, uh, PKI, basically, right? So, um, and this is... Um, this is a component that's uh, maybe lacking in some of the other systems. Uh, the, um, uh, the, the risk that you run in a, in a symmetric key system is that you'll receive a symmetric key that exists that isn't authenticated, is not um, applicable, it came from an attacker, whatever the case may be. And your key management system, unless they authenticate who that user is, isn't going to know that that key is a bad key. So then some other application that requests this key from, uh, from the key server would receive a key from a bad guy. So uh, the way to get around this is to use an authentication mechanism that uses a, you know, a mature trust model, PKI. But what's, uh, what's interesting here is that it's out of scope is uh, asymmetric key management. Um, there's no um, uh, message in the protocol to exchange private keys or public keys, uh, for example, in the same manner you would uh, exchange symmetric keys. And again, implementation is uh, sort of left up to the, the development um, folks. Uh, one other thing to note, and you'll see this in a little bit, this is, um, uh, this is a, a very XML. Um, it's, well, not very XML. It's all XML. Um, it's uh, all XML all the time. The, the last one is uh, IETF uh, Keyprov. Uh, IETF, um, the Keyprov uh, group, um, is it's a little bit of a, 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 I don't know, an enigma, I guess, uh, because the activity in the um, in the committee has been fairly sporadic, uh, and that's not something you want in a standards group, right? You want a, you want a standard to be uh, a well defined. Uh, you want the participants to be active. Uh, you want them to to um, be vocal in the community. You want them to push this stuff out there so that so that it gets adopted. Uh, unfortunately, the ITF um, uh, group has not been as active as it probably should be, uh, and that's changed a little bit recently. Very recently, there's been a, quite a bit uh, more activity. I think there's been some face changes and things like that. So that's a good thing. Um, but the uh, uh, this particular protocol is focused specifically on the provisioning of symmetric keys. So if you think about um, uh, a, a cell phone or a USB stick or, um, I don't know, any, any kind of uh, system or device and application, whatever the case may be, that's internet attached that does not have a symmetric key provision to it today, let's say. Um, 
This uh, protocol, uh, this standard, attempts to uh, define a way to provision keys on remote systems. So I'll go through this again. Uh, define protocols and data formats necessary for provisioning symmetric cryptographic keys and associated attributes. So when they say associated attributes, they mean things like key length or um, use or things like that. Um, and consider cases uh, related to the use of shared symmetric key tokens. Um, other use cases may be considered for the purpose of avoiding unnecessary restrictions, design, and sure for future extensibility. So, so in scope, uh, provision existing keys. Uh, this is not meant to be a, uh, a language or a protocol uh, to exchange keys back and forth between devices. Um, and out of scope, asymmetric keys um, and specific implementations. So the common thread through all four of these is that uh, there's very little um, uh, consideration for asymmetric uh, key management, uh, very little consideration for certificate uh, key management or even certificate management as a whole. Oh, I should probably mention this. Um, the, uh, some of the participants on, on this one here um, include uh, uh, NIST, which is an uh, American organization, uh, Active Identity, uh, some others. Um, it's, um, again, not, uh, not a who's who of, of cryptographic products or uh, security products in general. Oh, what was I saying before? Oh, asymmetric. Um, the, uh, if you think about this from a customer perspective, I, I know this was the problem I had in my, uh, my environment. Symmetric keys, much more prevalent than, than certificates. I might have a couple of thousand certificates, but I might have several thousand uh, symmetric keys, especially in the financial industry. Um, uh, I, I might not track asymmetric key pairs at all. Um, I might leave that to users, foolishly. Um, PGP key rings probably wouldn't uh, manage that too much at all. So symmetric keys, um, these are the ones that live in the boxes that protect PIN information, uh, credit card information, bank information, social security, all that sort of stuff. So it's the, a level uh, higher than what you might normally protect um, in, you know, with some of the other uh, cryptographic controls. So, Again, from a customer perspective, I might have, you know, 11 or 12 different Talus HSMs and 15 SafeNet HSMs and, you know, I don't know, 12 Atala HSMs or something like that. And uh, getting them all to talk together mm, just wasn't happening. So from an interoperability perspective, that was the problem that uh, the vendor community was trying to solve when these, uh, some of these standards started up. So uh, we'll uh, size up the competition here. Um, and uh, that, that was pretty much just an overview of this stuff. So we'll start to really get into the details here next. So let's go over uh, KMIP. Uh, and again, that's a key management interoperability protocol. Uh, the, uh, the standard is at uh, community draft level right now. It's at a 1.0 spec, basically. Uh, I don't know if it's been released fully for comments or not yet. I th I'm pretty sure it has. There's, there's a meeting today. I, I think it's actually happening now, so yeah, somewhere around now. So I will be missing that. Um, it's a binary protocol. Uh, the other, um, the other uh, messages that you'll see, these are all XML based, um, but this is a binary protocol. And if you think about where these uh, vendors were coming from, uh, binary uh, communication means more to them than XML. Um, they want box to box communication, not uh, Java applet to uh, web browser communication. Uh, it's a standard TTLV tag type uh, length value um, that can be nested. I'll show you an example of that um, so you'll see what the uh, message looks like. The standard uh, itself defines objects, attributes, and operations. So you can think of an object as um, a base object like um, a key block, a uh, key value, uh, key wrapping data. Um, this is, um, it's sort of, you can think of it kind of like metadata maybe. Um, the objects, uh, and in, in, again in the objects class, there's managed objects, and those, so these are the, uh, these are the, the secret pieces. But it can also include uh, public pieces like certificates, um, key parts, template data, exam, you know, things like that. The attributes, um, this is more appropriately metadata, but um, 
Uh, there's some of that crossover in the base objects as well. The uh, attributes can include things like the identifier, the state of the key. And you think about uh, key states, uh, it's um, uh, uh, the life, lifespan of the key. Um, you know, is this an archived key? Uh, should I destroy this key? Um, you know, the, the, the different uh, life, uh, you know, life steps of a, of a key. Uh, usage limits, you can set uh, dates, limitations on keys, things like that. Uh, obviously, an algorithm is an al attribute of a key. Uh, and, uh, you know, for example, if I use, uh, tri if I say it's triple des um, or 2t des, then my, uh, my key value in the object is going to be uh, different than it would be if I specified AES 128 for length or whatever. Uh, issuer application data, um, pretty basic stuff. And uh, the operations. So um, I've, got all, I've got this thing, you know, it's a key blob. Um, what am I going to do with it? Or maybe I need to create a new one. So these are the different operations that are defined. Register, read key, um, derive, and there's different derivation um, operations and things like that. So I can also destroy a key. Um, the, um, the protocol um, has a concept for um, uniqueness for keys. So there's a global, uh, global uniqueness for, for a key identifier. And this is, uh, this is important so that uh, you don't have uh, keys that are named the same thing across uh, multiple, uh, you know, key management systems, or even across organizations. Obviously, the, uh, the list isn't uh, all inclusive here. How am I doing on time? Actually, oh, um, try to go through this a little faster. 1619.3 uh, is in uh, draft seven that came out in August 2009. Draft eight, I've seen some notes on the uh, board that says that hey, there's some, um, you know, modifications for draft eight. Uh, it defines a, a key management architecture model. Uh, I, I, if you're interested in this stuff, I strongly recommend you go and uh, grab the standard and flip through it really quickly. Um, it's very, uh, very interesting stuff uh, if you like <laughs> key management, I guess. Um, and uh, you know, so you get an understanding of what it is that they're trying to define. Uh, models, objects, uh, boring stuff. Uh, Models uh, also uh, specific to data at rest. So, um, the, the again, the important piece here is that it does not define a message between the different actors. So, um, uh, one box and you know some other box, they've got this standard to um, say how they should perform an, an action. So, um, it's a uh, it's a way to say um, how am I going to encrypt a particular block. Of data, so that everybody else that conforms to the standard can then decrypt this block, or understand that it's an encrypted block. But the message is, you know, not defined. Um, but they are proposing to adopt the KMIP um, uh, binary protocol for communication. When I show it to you, you'll, you'll uh, I don't, every, people like XML. Everybody like XML over binary. XML, yeah, XML. Who likes binary? Yeah. I don't like it, but you'll see it. It's uh, it's just a bunch of numbers. It reminds me of like some really ugly financial protocols. 1619.3 um, uh, also defines um, um, a, a desire request for an XML uh, specific protocol. So even if they do adopt the KMIP uh, standard, they will probably adopt one of the other pieces of of uh, data out there. KMIP is also said. Well, maybe we'll have an XML standard. Um, uh, IEEE has said, well, we've we've got this piece in the uh, standard that you know maybe we can adopt the the EKMI piece. That's kind of up in the air. We'll see. Um, e EKMI um, is that's not the name of the actual protocol, oddly enough, um, or not oddly enough. Um, there's two different um, uh, protocols for EKMI, and that's Enterprise Key Management Infrastructure. Follow along. Um, SKSML, which is Symmetric Key Services Markup Language, and Mobile um, a Symmetric Key Services Markup Language. And I didn't put that on here, but um, there's a subcommittee off of EKMI that's specifically focused on um, a key management between mobile devices. Um, 
the, uh, this, uh, the protocol uh, not only defines the semantics, the, the XML language, um, but also the components required. So um, these are the components. The um, uh, symmetric key management system, which is kind of the whole, the whole thing. Uh, symmetric key server, symmetric key client library. That's what all these little acronyms are. And it uses PKI as a trust mechanism for exchange. Um, it's not, uh, it's not uh, defined um, how the PKI is used. You could use PK, PK little i, I don't know if that's a concept that's familiar with folks, um, rather than PK big i. And some of you might have the scars, you know, the PKI scars on your back. Uh, it's kind of, you know, kind of totally aside. Uh, it's kind of funny that um, in the financial space, a lot of people are moving towards uh, PKI systems because they think that it reduces the uh, key management overhead, which is a bunch of crap. But uh, it doesn't matter because you know somebody sold them a bill of goods. So, you know, they you think that they would learn from the '90s, right? With the PKI rollouts, were just a total nightmare. But man, people don't learn. Whatever. Um, EKMI has a very well-defined set of requests and responses. I'll show you an example of a request. Uh, very long stuff, doesn't fit on a PowerPoint very well. Uh, I tried to fit it on as best as I could, so we'll, we'll walk through those in a few minutes. Uh, IETF Keyprov, um, uh, one thing that they, uh, they mentioned is they leverage a 4750, RFC 4758, uh, which is CTKIP, Cryptographic Token Key Initialization Protocol. If you want to read that RFC, go to rfc.net and you can have fun, but uh, we're not doing that today. Um, IT, IETF defines uh, three documents. Uh, DSKPP, which is um, uh, Dynamic Symmetric Key Provisioning Protocol, I think. And uh, PSKC, uh, which I forgot now too. I have to go back here and look. I always forget this one. Uh, and, oh well, no, there it is. Portable symmetric key container, there we go, okay. Uh, and there are different uh, stages of uh, documentation. Oh, the symmetric key format doc, so this is a, a definition of how the, uh, the key blobs are supposed to be formed. Uh, draft nine, draft four, draft six, if you know IETF, um, then you know that uh, the different uh, versions are always a dot one, or 1.0 until certain level, so these are different draft uh, versions. Um, it does, so differently than some of the other pieces, it does not define an architecture per se, um, but it does define um, uh, pretty clearly the use cases around provisioning keys to these internet uh, accessible cryptographic systems. So uh, you might think of, um, a cell, I think, cell phone or um, uh, even a, uh, a client library on a, on a remote system, those are probably the things that um, are most uh, applicable here. So, um, uh, you know, you got a, a cell phone, it's got some sort of secret in it. Um, when it was injected at a factory or whatever, you know what that secret is. You can send, um, uh, you know, some other secret material to the device. Um, I'll go through the protocol in a, in a second here, but. Um, you can see how this might be useful to be able to provision uh, new keys to a system that uh, maybe didn't have the keys before. Uh, typical client-server interaction, um, there's a, a two-pass and a four-pass uh, protocol. Uh, it's very, um, you know, if you look at it on a diagram, it, it, it's, you, you, you would see it uh, right away. Two pass, you know, you send a, a server hello and authentication credentials and, you know, what you want to do, and then you get a response back. Pretty basic. Uh, four pass is similar, but it breaks down the, the middle pieces into two other, uh, two other pieces. Uh, so what do the messages look like? Um, and uh, uh, like I said, it's all ones and zeros. Uh, this is the message layout for KMIP. Um, the, the top piece up here, um, you can see the, um, uh, the unique identifier um, for this particular operation. And as I mentioned earlier, this is sort of a nested uh, binary protocol. So tag type, length value, each one that's on the inside is more specific than, than the one it is wrapped with. So that top big string of numbers is the message. And that big string of numbers, I wish I had my pointer, it broke, sorry. Uh, that big string of numbers is uh, laid out in, in these uh, different pieces here. So 
if you look at that big string of numbers, and I don't know if it's legible all the way in the back, but um, if you look at the first string of numbers there, uh, 420078, uh, that means um, that it is a request message. Um, and it breaks it down all the way down to the very end, um, which is, um, here's the integer type. So that's, that's what the message looks like. So uh, again, thinking back to um, um, what the, um, uh, what the purpose of, of this particular committee or what the goal of this, this committee was. So they wanted to be able to move data back and forth between boxes. So this is much more efficient uh, than passing uh, XML around. Um, I'm going to skip that right there. Uh, and which would look something like that, you know. A lot of, lot of information. Uh, if I do it in a number string, shorter, I could parse it whatever the case may be. Plus, these guys are like gearheads, and they thought this was better. And application guys, they can just smoke that XML crack. So 1619.3, uh, I'm not going to show you a message, because no messages are defined. Um, but they do very rigidly define some things called um, uh, object names. Um, so if you think about um, down here, if you look at these here, uh, KM, uh, key object, um, and this would be the location, a URI for a particular object. And you can define uh, all the objects that are defined in the, uh, uh, in the standard through a URI. Oops. Um, and you can see right here, uh, here's a policy, here's a policy URI, um, here's a key uh, URI. So lots of, uh, lots of different ways to, to um, uh, address uh, different uh, pieces of information. I, I didn't, uh, I didn't, I truncated this XSD. This is the uh, um, EKMI symmetric key um, XSD request. Um, and you can, you know, like this is all, again, public information. You can go look at it. Um, it's not uh, uh, terribly uh, mind blowing. Um, but uh, you can look at this um, here and you can see uh, real basic. Uh, uh, skip that documentation stuff. That's just you know worthless comments. Um, you look at the this first element here, which is uh, global key. Similar to uh, the other standards, there's a, there's an idea of global uniqueness for keys, um, and the way that they approach a global uniqueness is different depending on which standard it is. Some go to I, IANA. One of them, uh, I think EKMI went to uh, uh, the guys that, that assigned MAC numbers. Um, since we're running short here, I'm just going to flip through these. This is the uh, two-pass key request sample for um, IETF. Um, you know, again, basic stuff. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't take much to get a key from one place to another. Um, I do want to talk just for a second about overlap here. Um, the uh, you know when we started we say well which one's going to come out on top you know who's going to win who's going to lose. Um, uh, the reality is that there's a lot of overlap in the different places, and there's a lot of places that, that you know, uh, ITF, for example, does not touch at all uh, key storage, um, whereas uh, KMIP is very um, focused on interoperability between storage devices. Um, IT, uh, IEEE is totally, uh, uh, you know, storage focused, stored data at rest. So. Um, you know, and you can look at uh, the app more application friendly stuff, Keyprov, EKMI, a new future uh, came up piece. I think I'm probably one second off, off of time. Um, the reality is that there's no easy answers. Um, I believe that uh, the EKMI uh, standard is probably going to go by the wayside. Um, I think the IETF uh, standard will get uh, some adoption, but uh, it'll be in very tight. Uh, use cases and the clear winners are going to be KMIP um, as a Uber standard and IEEE in the storage space. So, any questions? Yes. Now that uh, next year the root DNS will be signed with, with DNSSEC and probably some TLDs and enterprises will also move to DNSSEC. Any recommendations on how to handle keys for that? 
Uh, that's a that's sort of a tough question because um, uh, for DNSSEC, it's a it's a pretty big, a um, uh, lot a lot of. Uh, I don't know, a lot of implications there. A couple of years ago, the uh, Department of Homeland Security tried to get VeriSign to give up the, uh, the DNSSEC root. Um, as far as I know, they told them to shove it. So uh, VeriSign is, um, uh, Ver it's VeriSign's problem uh, at this point, but um, you know, I, that's like a handful of keys, not you know, hundreds of thousands of keys. I think it's a little easier to manage. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not real sure how that's gonna play out. Um, I, I don't think that any of these standards are going to touch that stuff. I think we have to stop here uh, because the next speaker uh, also wants to speak. <laughs> so maybe we can take uh, additional questions out. I saw you had some questions. Maybe we can get together. Thank you.